Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's title is The Overt Partisanship of Alito and Thomas. Uh, you know, we've been in the, uh, it's been in the news for quite a while now. Uh, some of the misbehavior of some of our Supreme Court justices in the Supreme Court, uh, specifically Thomas comes to mind. Uh, and more specifically, the lavish gifts that he's received over the many years without uh, any disclosure and uh, thus giving the appearance that he may be bought and paid for. Uh, it's a perception problem, but it's also a conundrum. Then recently in the last week, we have uh, the news reports about Justice Alito flying flags at his various properties, one specifically as main residence, uh, the American flag hung upside down, which traditionally meant uh, that America's in distress. But this one took on a little bit of a different meaning that it had some connections to January 6th. And then not to forget his other um, vacation property where you had the flag um, of the, the, the stand for a Christian, a, a Christian nation type flag that was used during the Revolutionary War. Also a perception problem. So to discuss that with me today, my esteemed co-host, Jay Fidel, and our special esteemed guest, Manfred Henningston. Busy, busy little bees are our Supreme Court justices. And Jay, to you is, what's your take on the news reports about Justice Alito having the flag that is hung upside down at his property in his driveway, uh, indicating, again, the same flag that was flown on the January 6th invasion of the Capitol, and he, uh, he has the audacity to blame his wife. Uh, this was not a one-day event, by the way. This, uh, this flag was hung for multiple days in a row, and he said he didn't see it, and it was his wife's fault. And then fast forward to fast forward to his vacation property where he's flying another flag that um, is called the the freedom flag. Uh, again, George Washington used this flag himself, but it, it tends to indicate it's a, a Christian nation type activity. Uh, your thoughts on the flag waving, uh, flag flying, and also uh, Justice Thomas and his acceptance of lavish gifts. Let me break it down. Um, yeah. You spoke about Alito first. Um, blaming it on his wife is really tacky. They live together. They're in the same house. Uh, if he didn't uh, know that she was flying the flag, then he's blind. I don't think he's blind. I think he's lying. And the problem with that is that, you know, you really want to have uh, members of the Supreme Court, the justices of the Supreme Court, tell the truth. You want to have confidence in them. You want to rely on their character and their integrity. And here the man is lying in public mm, to the world. So um, it's really tacky. And, and what it suggests is that somewhere along the line, we have, we have lost the quality of justices that we have always wanted and assumed in our lifetimes. <clears throat> That's the thing about Alito. The other thing about Alito and his wife, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be charitable and say they both agreed about the flag. The flags, all the flags you mentioned, and they're both, uh, you know, they both revealed that that they're Trumpers. They both revealed um, that they're not impartial. They're politically prejudiced. They're politically committed um, to that side of the equation, and and he's not supposed to be in that place. He's not supposed to be biased. He's not supposed to be political. And yet here he has made a statement to the nation that he is political, that he and his wife are both political. Why does this remind me of Clarence Thomas and his wife, Ginny? Huh? Um, in any event, um, you know, this is completely unacceptable. I don't think it's ever happened before. And it's in our face because even after Alito gets criticized for this, he keeps on doing it with phony baloney. Hmm, excuses. Okay. Let's go to Thomas. We've heard more about Thomas over the past several months. And um, it's really interesting. While you were making your introduction, I was saying to myself, I wonder if he got gifts from organizations and people who were not related to issues before the Supreme Court. That if it was, you know, just somebody who liked him a lot and who he considered a friend and they had some kind of relationship, and you couldn't say necessarily that it was, it was a quid pro quo except for their friendship relationship. 
Would that be okay? And the answer is no, it wouldn't. You know, they've got to be pristine, you know. My experience um, as a military judge was you didn't touch the other side. You didn't talk to anybody about it. You certainly didn't accept gifts. You had to sort of, you had to surround yourself in, a, in, a, in, in an isolated fashion so that you would never have the appearance of impropriety, of, uh, of partiality, never, ever. And, and all judges know this, but for it to happen on the Supreme Court is, is really awful, really unacceptable. You know, he was never a good judge anyway, in my opinion. Um, he never did the right thing. His, and his appointment with the assistance of Joe Biden years ago, um, you know, was sort of questionable. In fact, very questionable. This man does not have character. His wife does not have character. Really, if you had a loving wife and you were on the Supreme Court, she would support the pristine quality of your service there. Neither of these wives is doing that. Both of them are obviously, you know, to any observer, um, in a cocoon of partiality, and the wrong partiality, I might add, um, in, in terms of their personal relationships, and, and that obviously affects their work on the court. So what's happened here is the court has come down. It, is, it, has, it has fallen from grace, Tim. And it has fallen from grace with these two individuals, but they infect the others. They infect the whole court. You lose confidence in them. You lose confidence in one of the three branches of government. You lose confidence in the whole system. And it, it is truly amazing to me that both of them don't care about the public losing confidence, the country losing confidence. And third parties lose confidence not only here in this country, but elsewhere. You know, the cut, this looks like a bunch of buffoons up there in the Supreme Court. You know, I practiced law for 50 years. I've never expected this sort of thing to happen. The world has looked at the United States as a city on the hill, the beacon of democracy. The world never expected this to happen. It is a black eye for both eyes. And it is a black eye for our government. My view of it is, and, and Manfred has other thoughts, I'm sure, but it cannot be reversed. It is a permanent black eye. Okay, so let me go to my point, and that is, right now, as you know, and Manfred, I'm sure you've, you, you're you aware of, Congress has the lowest ratings as far as uh, the American public thinking that they're competent. Uh, those ratings are in the single digits, I think. Uh, the presidency has very low ratings right now as far as confidence from the American people. The Supreme Court was the last leg of the, of the tripod to instill confidence that our government is working. Yet, to your point you just made, is it's a black eye and it's not going to be reversed. Um, a Marquette Paul uh, School surveys uh, back in March of 2024 showed that 60% of that polling uh, was a high disapproval. 40% uh, approved. So, if, if America or Americans lose their respect and or they lose their uh, confidence in the Supreme Court. Are we in dire straits as far as the government as a whole? I, yes, I think you have Go ahead, um, absolutely right. And I agree with everything that uh, Jay had been saying uh, before. It's not only the black eye for the Supreme Court. I think the Supreme Court, the Roberts Court may be the worst of uh, you know, the Supreme Court in, in history. But I think the American political system as a whole is in trouble. And uh, this year, 2024, you know, will become a very, very troubling and dangerous year. Um, I don't know. I still believe that there's enough, there are enough reasonable uh, Americans who will not bring Trump back to power. But there are a lot of others who say, they will. And that will be the culmination uh, of the self-destruction of the American political system. Now, when you go to the Supreme Court, I do not quite understand. Well, I understand. I mean, have, having read the Constitution, that there are no provisions in, in the Constitution about uh, how long these judges can serve. And I think this lifetime appointment 
is absolutely awful. Uh, you know, these guys, I mean, it made sense, you could say, at the time when the Constitution was framed, because people died earlier. Uh, but now, you know, I'm 86. <laughs> the judge is reaching the same age. And I do not want to become, I mean, I do not want to continue teaching after I've done it for 50 years. Uh, and I think there should be a limit. Uh, whether one can introduce that limit now, I don't know, because then you have this other absurd notion of originalism that, uh, you know, the Supreme Court judges and their defenders constantly carry around. I don't know what that means, you know, uh, going back to the orig origin of uh, the design of the Constitution, reading, you know, the minds of the, the founders. For God's sake, you have had amendments again and again, which confirm that, uh, you know, the Constitution was not an eternal document, but was open for changes. Uh, otherwise, you know, if we believe in the originalism, we should reintroduce slavery. Yeah, I, I want to interject something here. We have an outcry from uh, various members of the government, specifically uh, Dick Durbin, who's the senator chair for the Judicial C Committee, <clears throat> saying overtly that uh, Alito and, and Thomas need to recuse themselves on any case that comes before them, particularly any of the January 6 cases and specifically the immunity case that's before them. Uh, what you're feeling about uh, the demand and the cry? Yeah, the dem for, demand for, is, is wonderful. The, the demand is wonderful, it, you know. But I don't think they will. They won't do it because they are beyond reason at this point. It seems. Well, okay. Uh, so let's say they opine on a judgment on a case, and to what degree is their decision going to be accepted by the at least fifty percent of the American public? I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I mean, I at this point, you know, you have to question 50% uh, of the American people making rational decisions. Before we go to, you know, what Manfred can tell us about the um, structure of the Supreme Court in Germany, which I think is very informative, um, but uh, in terms of reform. Um, but I'd like to add one other thing. You know, you have the American Bar Association. You have the bar associations in all the states. This is really not controversial in the sense that we're, we're talking about ethics here. We're talking about impartiality. It's not complicated. Um, and yet, and yet, there is a deafening silence among the profession, the legal profession, the American Bar Association, the bar associations in all those states, the practicing lawyers, the government lawyers. Nobody wants to say anything. I find it completely ridiculous. Now, I think that some of them say, well, you know, someday I may have to appear or my firm may have to appear or my colleagues or clients may have to appear in front of the Supreme Court. So I better not say anything. That is really unacceptable. We collectively, we, mm, the, the legal profession collectively has a duty to speak up about this. And they haven't. They didn't while Trump was in office, and they should have, while he was making those absurd appointments, they should have spoke up. And they didn't speak up in, in, during Biden's term either. They haven't said boo. And so when we talk about the failure of the Supreme Court, we're not just talking about those two judges or those nine judges. We're talking about the entire legal profession around the country. So quiet. One point uh, to criticize with uh, Jay's statement. I mean, at the same time, and everything that he just said is true, but you see extraordinary judges perform their duties in a way that is quite amazing in New York and in Georgia. Uh, so you have a functioning uh, judicial I mean, you could almost say that these trials uh, are a wonderful uh, illustration of what justice in America should be and could be and has been. But uh, at this point, you know, it is not the Supreme Court that lives up to, these, uh, to this paradigm. It's, 
the lower courts. The average person on the street. Of course, you know, those who are concerned about government lose confidence in a court like this. And they lose confidence in the system when they see this happening because they know the Supreme Court is on top of all the other courts. But there's something else too. <clears throat> there's, there's the ordinary citizen and he sees this or she, and they say, hmm, I don't have to follow the law. The law doesn't exist anymore. There is no retribution. There is no accountability. There is no responsibility. And this affects their decisions and their behavior. A lot of people are conducting themselves in a way consistent with the failure of the legal system to work. Can't you argue that a thousand convictions on January 6th uh, sends a message to the American people? Well, that's kind of an aberration because if Trump gets back into office, uh, he'll, he has said on num a number of occasions he will reverse all those convictions. And people take it seriously. Nobody is, this is not so. Um, and there's no way to stop it. And do you have any confidence in the Supreme Court to try to stop it? I'm not sure they have the authority. Before we go to Manford, uh, let's just talk a little bit about Justice Roberts and his role. Remember, he has limited authority over his justices. Um, he can suggest, he could try to prod a little bit, uh, but he really doesn't have any overt authority to determine whether or not they, uh, they recuse or not recuse themselves from a particular case. Your thoughts on Justice Roberts and his um, feckless approach? Um, well, let me, let me say this. We also have the other members of the Supreme Court who are more law-abiding, perhaps, uh, at least the, um, you know, the liberal judges anyway. Um, but they don't, aside from their comments and dissents and the like, they don't make a whole lot of public statements about it. So what you have is, um, you know, the, the public communication by Thomas directly and indirectly through his wife and so forth and his behavior. Um, and the same thing with Alito. He's, he's making a statement with that flag on the lawn. Um, and the others are not. The others are not saying, hey, you're off, you're off base here, man. You've got to cut that out. None of them. Roberts should be saying something. I agree. He could be, should be. This is the role that history has put him into. And yet he is not, he's not doing anything. So it could be um, a, a solution or at least a, a balance if he said something or some of the others said something, but they aren't, they don't. And I take it collective. This is the way they want to conduct themselves. And this court, um, because of two or possibly, you know, more of the six supermajority, um, they're, they're a waste. Collectively, they're doing the wrong thing on so many cases. You can predict they will do the wrong thing. Everyone can predict that. Okay. Uh, Manfred, let's go to you. Um, give us a different perspective. Uh, tell us what they did in Germany uh, after World War II as far as their Supreme Court. Well, look, the American Supreme Court was a model uh, for 200 years, uh, not only in Germany. You, uh, German liberals in the 19th century tried to get in the 1840s <clears throat> something like that <clears throat> when they designed the Constitution, but it didn't get off the ground. Now, in 1949, when the Constitution, the Grundgesetz was passed for West Germany, uh, the German Bundesverfassungsgericht, the Supreme Court, uh, was designed to have two senates, uh, not one, but two senates with each eight judges. Uh, one was the, the, ju the judges for one was uh, selected by uh, the Bundestag, the parliament, and the other by the Bundesrat, that's the uh, council of the 15 states of the Federal Republic. Uh, they were appointed for 12 years and no reappointment was uh, possible. So what you have there are institutional constraints that I think are absolutely wonderful. You, I mean, you have political balance, you have two uh, senates, and not only the nine judges, uh, no one uh, can stay longer on a, 
one of the courts then six, until 60 AD, the age of 60 AD. That's mandatory retirement. So all of these things, uh, you know, from uh, adding or maybe designing two senates for the American Supreme Court, having eight judges on each, uh, and having getting rid of the life appointment uh, would be marvelous. But I, I mean, that would mean a constitutional convention. Let me ask you this: you know, we have whoever the president's going to be in November and take the oath, the office in January 2025. Uh, they may well have the opportunity to appoint either two, three, possibly four Supreme Court justices. Um, Alito is 74 right now. Uh, Thomas is 75. John Roberts, uh, Justice Roberts, is in his 70s. And we know that uh, Sotomayor has some uh, health issues with type 1 diabetes. So there's a lot of speculation that uh, the next president could have incredible influence uh, right. for the next 20 years. To go back to Jay's <clears throat> attack on Roberts, I think Roberts could redeem himself if he would retire and make it possible for Joe Biden you know, to appoint his successor. That would turn the bad image of Roberts as uh, you know, the, the chief justice today into a positive image. And the other somewhat more funny uh, option would be if for whatever reason, Clarence Thomas suddenly vanished and Joe Biden had the opportunity to appoint uh, Anita Hill as his successor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, good one. Well, you know, we have a situation here, uh, Jay, we have a situation like um, Justice Ginsburg uh, she didn't step down, and in the end, her health failed. And uh, the opportunity for her to step down, retire, um, that opportunity was lost uh, for Joe Biden to appoint someone else in that, that spot. Uh, your thoughts about uh, the same situation was uh, Sotomayor. Her health isn't exactly up to, to, to par. Um, or what do you think about Manfred's suggestion about Justice Roberts? The whole thing evokes for me a platform plank uh, that Joe Biden should be harping on. Um, what he what he can say is, look, um, the justices get old, they get sick, they're going to have to you know, retire at some point. They won't be able to serve. If I'm president, I'm going to appoint justices in a functional court. I will effect reform on this court by appointing justices who are balanced, who don't have these shenanigans, uh, who don't follow you know, political party lines of Trump. I will give you good justices. He doesn't say that. He should stand on a stump and say that all day. I will give you a better Supreme Court. I'm not sure what it is with him. Maybe it's his years in government. But he, he treats them as sacrosanct, even though, hey, guys, they're not sacrosanct. One possibility is that during another four-year term by Biden, he could clean this up, assuming that they either, um, you know, that the, the right-wing justices uh, are for some reason are off the court. Um, the, other, the other possibility with Joe Biden has not addressed, and the people who speak on this issue keep suggesting it, is the court needs reform. And as Manfred points out, the Constitution is a little vague on the Supreme Court. And that means the, the Congress could add, add seats, add justices. This is what um, FDR did in his, I guess, his, his third term back when, when they had third terms. Um, he packed the court. Um, and, and frankly, that's, I think, what Biden should have addressed early on. Because early on, it appeared this court is not functional. Six to three, even if they were less bias, wouldn't work. We've got to have a different format for this court. You know, life term is too long. I totally agree with Manfred. You know, you can, you can live to 110 and be completely out of it and still on this court. Some of them are out of it long before that, by the way. Um, so, you know, what should happen here is Congress should address these things. Term limits. Uh, the number of justices, and fix it. 
It is a critical part of our government and we cannot afford to have everything under this sort of irrational capstone that affects the whole country. It filters down to everything in our political lives, in our communities. We cannot let this continue. So A, I think Biden ought to make it a platform point, and B, I think he ought to do something. He hasn't done anything so far. Let me suggest a C for you, and that is Senator Durbin needs to get off his chair and do something. And to what degree should the media put or, or amplify this deplorable situation in the Supreme Court? Have they done an adequate job for, with that, Jay? It's not where I meet, you know, and so it's, it's sort of like the weather, you know. Um, I wrote a piece recently about the weather. The media reports very matter of fact, very flat effect that we have storms and surges and, and wildfires and droughts and floods and all this. They don't connect it up with, with climate change. They don't make a, you know, a pitch at the end of every news story about obvious um, effects of climate change to say, you know, the world has got to do something. Instead, the world gets involved in wars um, and geopolitics and contentions of all kinds, doesn't do anything about climate change. Sorry, that's the United Nations, again, doing nothing for us. What I get is this, the same kind of thing. So, so the press says, oh, they just did the Dobbs case, too bad, the implications are awful, but they don't find a solution. Um, they don't find a solution at the state level, and they don't find a solution in, in terms of reforming the court. Um, every one of these bad decisions should be met with commentary. This is so not only in the Supreme Court level, it's at all courts. I find that lawyers and the bar and the legal profession does not criticize the courts as much as they should. With every decision, there ought to be feedback. With every decision, there ought to be a suggestion. They, they, the, the, we, we have to make the judiciary work again, and the Bar Association is the best place. And as you suggest, the media is a really good place. You can say, by the way, the courts um, you know, convicted a lot of people who were there on January 6th, as you did a little while ago. But I want to add something. They could have convicted them in greater numbers. There were many more there, and they could have done it a lot quicker. They took years to do it. And, you know, there's a rule of sort of human nature. That the sooner you make someone accountable, um, you know, the, the more you will deter others from doing the same thing. If you wait for years and years and years and you do it sloppy and you do it without any certainty, without evoking confidence on the part of the public, um, you're not sending the message. You could argue that with uh, the prosecution of Donald Trump. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, Manfred, let me ask you something. Jay has suggested that uh, the Bar Association, President Biden, are basically stuck in neutral and they're not making their points about the Supreme Court. Uh, let me have you, I, I'm going to speculate and you tell me if maybe I'm off base or not. Uh, maybe Joe Biden's not putting anything out uh, using the, um, the bully pulpit about the Supreme Court is because we have an election coming up here in November 2024. Maybe he's concerned that uh, there may be a case between Donald Trump and, and President Biden that needs to be decided as Al Gore was with Bush. Uh, maybe he's concerned about uh, any criticism about the justices before any potential case like that were to come before the justices. That's just a thought, but what's your thinking of why President Biden has not taken this issue up about the Supreme Court? He remembers one thing when he was vice president of Obama, that Obama, I don't know how powerful it was, tried to make Ginsburg retire because he knew you know, that she was in bad health, but she did not respond to it. And so all the critique that Jay had against conservatives or others in the political system, he should also talk about Ginsburg and her liberal supporters. Uh, I mean, I drive every day up Sierra Drive in Kaimuki and pass at the, at the at Dunn Corner, 
a sign, you know, celebrating dissent, meaning Ginsburg. I mean, these people are crazy. If for some strange reason, they still have not understood that Ginsburg was responsible for, uh, you know, another conservative giving uh, giving Trump the opportunity to appoint another conservative to the Supreme Court. So this is not a one-way street. Uh, in this case, you know, the liberals are as much to blame as uh, the conservatives are with uh, the appointments to, to, to the Supreme Court. Ginsburg is to blame uh, also. But if you do that, you know, you become a pariah. Uh, you're not allowed to, to uh, create this uh, symbol, you know, of righteousness. I don't think she was right. She was wrong. Mm -hmm. All right, great points. Uh, we have run out of time, so I'm going to go to you, Jay, and uh, get your final thoughts on this topic. I think the most salient thing that comes to me from this discussion is that um, we can't see them as sacrosanct. We have to speak out against them, what they do, how they conduct themselves, and their opinions and procedures. They're not getting enough flack. You know, I remember we had a show years ago about the Hawaii Supreme Court. And um, John Drubinsky was there at the panel and he said, uh, you know, the funny thing is the Hawaii Supreme Court is not always right. And sometimes it does things that are against the public in, in interest and against, uh, you know, the precedent for that matter. And nobody says anything. And the law school in UH should be speaking out when this happens, but they simply report the case. We can't afford to simply report the case. We have to speak on the case. We are a community. We are a legal community. Everyone has a responsibility um, to speak on all uh, branches of government, including this one. Great point. Manfred, uh, you get the last word on this topic. Well, my last word is my first, that the Supreme Court needs reform and get rid of uh, you know, the lifetime appointments. It's absolutely crazy. That's enough. That's well said. To the point. Pithy, yes. I say. Pithy. I would like to thank my, my esteemed guests, Manfred Henningston, and my co-host, Jay Fidel. Thank you for a, an engaging discussion on this hot topic. Won't you join us next week at American Issues Take One? I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And until then, aloha.